Well, good morning, dear saints of God. It's the Lord's Day, and we are blessed to gather together to worship the risen Christ. I'd like to give a special welcome any of those who are visiting us this morning. We are grateful for you. I think I saw my dear brother, Lance Gentry. Are you here? I thought I saw him walking in. Maybe he wasn't. All right. He's not here. All right. I was going to welcome him special. Um, We're studying through Paul's epistle to the Romans. Some have called it the greatest epistle ever written. I believe all the scriptures are God-breathed. But what is revealed in Romans has been used uh, of God for many awakenings and many revivals. And God has used this letter to do many great things throughout the history of the church, and he continues to do so in our midst. And I've been so encouraged by his kindness to us in these last days, as he's been very merciful to Southside Bible Church. This is a letter about how God brings transformation, and it's about how he brings about the obedience of faith, which is at the beginning of the letter and how he closes his letter. And so we are knee deep in it, and uh, my soul is just loving this study. This morning, we will continue, and if you'll open your Bibles, we're going to be in Romans chapter 7, and we're going to begin looking at verses 14 through 25. I got a card a while back that they were advertising their church and said, we are the home of the 29-minute sermon, and that's my length of introduction. And this is the first time since I've been a minister that our introduction is the whole sermon, so I apologize ahead of time. Uh, This is a beautiful passage, and it's been one of my favorites since I was born again. And my prayer is that I would, uh, it would stay that way. After wading through documents and papers and books and sermons and talking with brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, it, it is written to help with our obedience of the faith. And I'm praying that it would do just that. Uh, in all of our hearts. And so this passage is one that many commentators have called the hardest part to interpret in the book of Romans. And after hours and hours of studying, I truly find that to be the case. And so we'll have to work hard to seek to understand the verses that are before us. And, and what I'm going to ask is that you carry a gracious spirit into these words. As it's agreed upon by all of your elders... Uh, that two main positions that I'm going to boil the interpretations down. There's probably about 30 different interpretations of Romans 7, 14 through 25, but I think there's two main ones that conservative Christianity would grab. Um, And so let's take a, a look at those this morning. And so I want you to hear that. You can differ on this interpretation and still have the exact same understanding of sanctification in your Christian life. And so if we have a difference on these few verses, uh, we can have a, a unity on what Scripture teaches in all of the Bible about how we live out our Christian life called sanctification. And yet, there's only one true interpretation of Scripture. By, by the grace of God then, and much prayer, I hope to share what I think that one is uh, in the next two weeks. And so the tough question of this passage is quite simple as we begin uh, Sean read it in our introduction this morning. Paul, is Paul writing about himself now as a believer? Uh, it, about a time, I'm sorry, is Paul writing about himself now? He, he's a believer writing this letter. Is he writing about it, though, when he was unsaved, under the law, kind of looking back at that time, and now he's bringing this out in verses 14 through 25, when he was unconverted and what the law was doing in his heart? Or is Paul writing about himself right now in a battle with sin as a believer uh, as he's penning that letter? That is really the debate and the trying to understand who is the wretched man of Romans 7. And often in tough passages, you kind of have your liberal scholarship and your conservative scholarship. But this passage is, is really kind of split with conservative scholars And some of my professors that I studied under and go-to preachers and best friends and even your elders of this church uh, differ on the interpretation of those two possibilities. 
And so the one mistake that I think you could make if you've already made it this morning is, oh, this is simple. <laughs> it's simply Paul is a believer. Or it's simply Paul is an unbeliever. I, I hope by the time we finish, you realize it's not simple. <laughs> it's difficult. And so the need for prayer is felt even deeper as we begin. And so let's go to our God and ask that he would uh, meet us and begin to open this text up for our good and that he would be worshiped here in our time in the Word. Father, I do come before you, and I believe this passage is essential in our journey in the Christian life. And I pray now that by your Spirit, you would lead and guide us in the truths of this passage. I pray, Lord, that um, you would set free uh, some from deep, deep affliction and and burden, um, struggle, and lack of assurance maybe for even a wrong reason. God, I pray that this morning you would um, use your words in a mighty way for this body. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. I'd like to look at these different views then. And again, I'm going to just look at the two main ones that are uh, dividing up conservative Christianity. And so we'll look first at this view of, this is Paul unregenerate. So this is Paul writing uh, about when he was un saved. And so this view holds that Paul is writing about this again in his pre-conversion Pharisaic state. And so this is, this is a converted man, Paul, writing about his experience when he was under the law and when he was under sin and death. And so, of course, him sharing his testimony now and writing this is an enlightened understanding of how Paul looked back at his time under the law. He, he understands it uh, clear. My, my testimony now is different from how I would have shared it when I was an unbeliever. I, I didn't understand all that was going on, but now I look back with enlightened understanding and even see more what God was doing in my life. So it's a retrospective look back at his self-deceived pattern of life as an unbeliever under the law, what we've been learning in Romans 7. And so this view has some very strong arguments. And I think the biggest one is it just doesn't seem to fit uh, with Romans 6 if, if he's a believer. Because you come, you look at Romans 6 verses 1 through 2, and Paul says, you, you've died to sin. Don't you know that you were joined to Christ and you were buried and you've been raised to walk in newness of life? And we studied it thoroughly that sin no longer has dominion over you. Uh, listen to Romans 6, 6. Paul says, knowing this, that our old self, what you were in Adam, was crucified with him. It's a aorist tense. It's done. It, it happened. That the body of sin might be done away with, rendered inoperative, that sovereign control that it had, that we should no longer be due losses to sin, these slaves, these willful slaves giving yourselves to sin. Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? You're not under law, but you are under grace. Romans 6, 15 through 23, you're no longer slaves to sin. You have a new slavery. You have a new slavery to God, and you present yourselves to God for obedience to Him. He says, and that results in sanctification, a growing holiness and conformity to Him. Romans 6, 17 says, you are not a slave and then we come and look at Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. And so 6, 17 says, you're not in bondage. You're not a slave. And 7, 14 now says, I'm in bondage to sin. And Romans 7, 4, the only way to bear fruit for God is to die to the law and be married to Christ in order that you might bear fruit for him Romans 7, 6, we serve now in the newness of the Holy Spirit, regeneration, and now the law is written within our heart, and we desire to obey because we love the King. All new covenant, all the things that we've been studying for months and months, learning. And now we come to Romans 7, 14 through 25, and we see in verse 14 that Paul says, I'm carnal, I'm fleshy, <clears throat> I serve the law of sin, and it took me captive. And it just sounds like way too much slavery after everything that we've been learning in chapter 6. And so there is a true difficulty in that understanding. And so this is a man presenting that he wants to do good, but he keeps doing evil 
in the present tense. And so I, I, I want to do good. I desire with my mind to do good, but I keep sinning. And, and, and it just feels so uh, continual defeat. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't smell and feel like Romans 6 of what we've been studying. Romans 7, <coughs> 25, if you'll look at it. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, my flesh is serving, I want you to hear that, the law of sin. And then look at Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. So here's this bondage to the law of sin in Romans 8, 2. Now you've been set free from the law of sin. And so these are some difficult issues. And so I've been very compelled by this argument. And again, I preached Romans 20 years ago, and I, I think I dismissed this view way too easily. I think it has very uh, concrete argument to it. Uh, I, I think in part, based on uh, experience, you know, any believer who's battled against sin uh, has this tendency where you're like, yeah, oh, I get what Paul is saying here. And I'll just share this morning, that's a bad hermeneutic. That is not how you get a right interpretation of Scripture, how I feel or what my experience is. But what does the Scriptures teach? And so this passage is Paul continuing to explain what we looked at last week in verses 7 through 13, how the, the law uh, aroused sin and stirred it up, and that which was to give me life actually brought me to death. And so how sin affected my death through something so good as the law, the, the law is good. And so the, the question is, who, who will set me free from this? Romans 8 is life in the spirit. It's, it's new covenant talk of the Christian life and how we walk in the spirit and put to death the deeds of the flesh and, and mortify sin. And so there's just a, a great beauty to this view with some compelling arguments and great scholars of our day who we all respect who hold to this. <clears throat> so it's a great message. If you're sitting here this morning, still under law. And what I want you to see is if you're living under law and all you've tried to do your whole life is clean your life up and fix it, and you, you just continue to get nowhere, and you, you, there's no change, there's no being set free, you're just moral and you're religious and there's no transformation, that's a great message for you this morning. But you, you need to die to that. There's a salvation from that bondage. That's not normal Christianity. That's not what we've been learning in Romans, even in this passage and in the weeks to come. So I've been laboring for that for months, to be a minister for your joy, to bring you out from under law so that you could come under the new covenant and live under grace and be forgiven, loved, accepted, the dominion of sin broken so that you could have the freedom that comes in being the children of God. That's what we've been looking at and laboring. So this, uh, qu the quick response to this view then is you mean to tell me that the believer doesn't struggle with sin? And I, I want you to hear this real clearly. The, the, everyone I know who holds this view believes that the believer battles against sin because the Bible teaches it. So no one here that holds to that that's a believer thinks that you don't have a battle against sin as a believer. You have a battle against sin as a new covenant believer. Is that what it's teaching though in the passage is what their argument is. It would be heretical and dangerous. The cliff that we cannot fall off of in this passage is that there is no battle with sin. You, you fall off that cliff and you're, that's going to do great harm and damage. Proponents of this view in no way believe that. <clears throat> they just don't believe that this passage is teaching it, but many others do. This passage just has too much failure, too much slavery and bondage and continual failure to be describing the believer in Christ. And the best hermeneutic in this passage, they would say, is that Paul then is an unbeliever battling against the law. Maybe a show of hands who holds this view. Put it up with confidence, guys. All right. Now I got to take that down. No, just kidding. <laughs> a week ago, I was going to preach that view. My struggles with this view. What Paul is saying in Romans 7, 14 through 25 
I just don't see that's what he says in other passages about his pre-conversion state. So as I look at all that <clears throat> Paul's ever described, what he was like as an unbeliever, he's, he's not a man stressed over his inability to fulfill the law's just demands like Romans 7, 18. Let me just read Romans 7, 15. For what I'm doing, I do not understand, for I'm not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate this. Whoever's writing this, Paul's writing this, whatever state he's in, this is a guy very broken over his failure and his sin. And I want you to listen to Philippians 3. Paul said, we're the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, <clears throat> if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more here we go. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law, found blameless, <laughs> blameless in keeping the law of God. And last week he, he said before the law came, he was alive and he's alive. I'm keeping it. I'm, I'm righteous. I'm fulfilling it. I'm a good boy. Look at me. I'm righteous. He, he, he's boasting of it. He was proud of it. I'm blameless as to the law. I see nowhere in scriptures where Paul was ever like what I read in Romans 7, 4, 14 through 25 as an unregenerate Jew. Just defeat, failure, brokenness. All I see is confidence. I'm keeping it. I'm doing it. Just opposite. Way too much brokenness over his failures that I just don't see as characteristic of the Pharisees. Just don't see that. Second, an unregenerate Jew could and did delight in the law of God. That's why Paul, this whole section, is he's having to argue, what about the law? The Jews are like, you just say and die to law, be done with law. They, they love the law. <laughs> what are you doing, Paul? What are you saying here? But look at Romans 7, 22. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. I had a friend once say to me, when you have a clear uh, statement with words that are so new covenant, don't move away from them very quickly. This is the whole promise of Ezekiel. <laughs> I'm going to take the law and I'm going to put it within your heart. I'm going to put it in your minds. And that's where he's going to go in verse 25. I will write them on your hearts and your minds. Uh, this whole section with, with my mind, I serve the law of God. And in my inner being, my inner man, I delight in the law of God. Flip over to Romans 8 verse 6. This is the very next chapter. <clears throat> For the mind set on the flesh is death. It's an unbeliever. It would, it would have been Paul if he was an unbeliever writing this. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is what? It, it's hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. It, it's, it's rebellious. You're not going to tell me what to do. And the law comes and it arouses and stirs up sin. It's, it's not a delight in the inner person. That's what a new covenant has to develop in a heart. So the whole new covenant is the transformation of the inner man. Under grace, dominion of sin is broken. And now we love the law because we love the law giver, which I call the law of Christ because Paul calls it that in 1 Corinthians 9. So here's my struggle. Last week, the law comes and it meets with rebellion. It arouses sin in the unbeliever. The heart is at enmity with God's law. Just, I'm not, you're not going to tell me how to live my life and what I'm going to do. But the inner man... Paul uses it in a few other places. I want to read a few. Ephesians 3.16. That he would grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. New, just all new covenant. 2 Corinthians 4.16. We don't lose heart. Our outer man's decaying, but our inner man is being renewed day by day in the new covenant of grace. Thirdly. Probably the hardest one for me to get past is in Romans 7, 7 through 13, as Paul's talking about his past as an unbeliever, every verb that he uses in that is aorist. And it's a, it's a past tense. It's action that's already happened in the past. 
And all of a sudden, in verse 14, all the way to the end of the chapter, he only uses one, ver- one tense. What do you think it is? Present tense. So he goes from past to present tense for the rest of this passage. And so there, there's, in the, there, there's the one argument on the other view is that there's something called a historical present. In the Greek, there is. And that, that is a, a, a way, it's very rare, but you can find, I, I haven't been able to find it in any of Paul's writings. If you do, bring it next week and I'll, I'll share it. But it, it's, you can actually talk about that, the past with a present tense to draw emphasis on it. <coughs> that is a possibility, but it just doesn't do it for my heart. Why didn't he use that in verses 9 through 11? So I can find no satisfactory answer for this transition from past tense into present tense unless he's now talking about a present reality where he uses I or me 40 times in this section. For uh, the switch, unless what he is now proving is that the culprit of sin, that what we saw last week, it fights the law of God, right? The the law is beautiful. It comes and sin's roused and stirred up. So it it fights the law of God. And in my present state, as a believer in Jesus Christ, sin still (laughs) uh, uh, fights. It still fights this new law that's put within my heart that wants to obey. I still have remaining sin that fights against my new desires. And and it's a battle And so sin is the culprit for justification that I need the penalty taken away. And now, as Paul's showing us, it's the culprit in our sanctification that that there's something fighting against us in this Christian life called remaining sin. And it still fights against the good desire of the law of Christ in our hearts. So we got new hearts that want to obey God with everything, with remaining flesh that is fighting against it. And it still works the same. It's just not raining, but it's still remaining in the believer. And the remedy is the same for both. Jesus Christ is the one who's going to deliver us from both of these battles. But one of my heroes through this whole journey of this study is J.I. Packer, who is now with the Lord. But he said, Paul's shift from the past tense to the present tense in verse 14 has no natural explanation save that he now moves from talking about his experience with God's law in his pre-Christian days to talking about his experience as it was at his time of writing. And I would have to agree with this godly saint uh, with a right view of Romans 7. Fourthly, <clears throat> look at Romans seven eighteen with me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Didn't we learn that in Romans 1 through 3? That is probably the truest thing of an unbeliever that there is. Nothing good dwells in me. I'm corrupted from my head to my toes. Paul showed that your will, your affections, your mind, your conscience, everything is broken. Nothing good dwells within you when you're born of Adam and you come into this world. Romans 1 through 3 proved it out. There's no one good, not even one. But Paul, (laughs) you have the Holy Spirit inside of you now. Jesus Christ dwells inside of you by faith. How could you ever say such a thing, nothing good dwells within me, that you should be stoned as a believer for saying that? So if Paul's a believer here, that is heresy. But I want you to see it would be, except he doesn't stop there. Verse 18, why does he keep going? For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Just stop if you're an unbeliever. That's true. But if you're a believer, that isn't true, and you better clarify it real quickly. Well, that is in my flesh. In my flesh, nothing good dwells within me as a believer. That that isn't even necessary if, if you're an unbeliever. You don't need to say that. Nothing good dwells in you. But if you're a believer, the only thing that isn't good that dwells within me, it's my remaining sin. It's my flesh, my sarks that's fighting against me. <clears throat> that is in my flesh. Fifthly, you enjoying the ride? Some of you look really bored, but this is important that we get this right. Fifthly, oh, Tim, thank you. Fifthly, this battle that Paul is describing, uh, he keeps saying this, it's not me, 
It's sin indwelling me. He says it like three or four times in this passage, but it's not me. It's sin indwelling me. And he just says it again and again. And he says, it's not the new I, uh, this new creation, this new I, it's, it's not me, but it's this indwelling sin that's fighting me and battling me. And so it seems to me that he's showing there's something inside of him that is keeping him from doing what his new I wants to do. This new creation. I, I, want, I love God. I want to obey him. That's who I am. But there's something within me that's still fighting that. And it's not a reigning rule, but it's a remaining rule. I'm going to say that 20 times. It's not president, but it's resident. There's remaining sin fighting the new I that's been born again and created by God in Christ Jesus. Without that, I think it's just an excuse. <laughs> that's blame shifting. As an unbeliever, I keep sinning, but it's not I. It's the sin within me. That's just blame shifting if you're an unbeliever. No, as an unbeliever, you sinned with your whole being. You weren't a divided man. Flesh, spirit, everything was in agreement in your sin. You just loved it. There was no battle. But in the new man, there is. And that's what he's describing in this passage. Okay, sixthly. Turn with me to Galatians 5. <clears throat> Galatians 5. And this is why every elder in this church believes that we have a battle against indwelling sin. We all know it to be real. We live in it. We shepherd it. None of us would believe in this sinful perfection that you can attain this side of glory. We are in a battle till glory to be set free from this remaining rot that is within every one of us. Galatians 5, what I just want you to notice as I'm about to read this, it has the same terms and description almost in Romans 7. There's no question Paul's writing about a believer in this passage, no argument in conservative scholarship. This is a believer uh, describing the believing life in Galatians 5. So listen to it, uh, read with me in verse 16. <clears throat> but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, and so there's a real desire of the flesh within every believer. And the flesh, what does it do? It sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Sounds a lot like Romans 7 to me. And I just don't find in scripture that an unbeliever has a part of him that delights in the law of God and wants to obey with his mind, but his flesh causes him to sin. The unsaved says, it is not I then, but indwelling sin. That is not the case. Paul has spent much time in this epistle to show you the corruption of the whole man under sin, not a part of him that wants to please God so bad with a principle of sin keeping him from it. I only can find that in an unbeliever. Seventh, one last thing that bothers me about this view, and I think you figured out what I believe. All right. Look with me in verse 24. This whole battle we're going to look at next week and unfold it, but he hits verse 24, and here it is, wretched man that I am. This is someone tormented in a deep, deep battle, and I, I believe either view fits that. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death. So uh, in the one view, it will be salvation. In the other view, it'll be this deep, hard battle with sin. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that will be the mantra of this church till we die. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Argument's over. Now let's get on with a believer and how we live the Christian life. But he, he finishes something real interesting. So then, so then on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So you, you get your deliverance, you get your freedom. So then, here's the reality for the believer as you go forward. This is the battle that you're in. I, don't, I, I can't get any other really good answer for the so then, in my mind. Uh, the other argument feels really good about their answer. So let's go on to chapter 8 and see where uh, conversion is and how we live in the Spirit's victory, which is true and big in chapter 8. 
So the best explanation I can see is that this is a cry for deliverance for the believer who has a new eye, a new creation. He desires to please God from the inside, his inner being, with this troublesome flesh that has hounded him all of his saved days, weary with it, but fighting every day that there is a day of deliverance coming for this one day for the believer. And I think it's to encourage you to never grow weary in this battle. It's going to end. And there's going to be when Jesus comes back and he delivers us from this battle once and for all. One day you'll be saved to sin no more. So then, until that day, you have this battle with a renewed mind to serve God and remaining flesh to serve sin. And so how do we battle it? We're going to move into Romans 8, and we're going to learn how to put to death the remaining sin within our body. And he's going to say, by the Spirit of God. So what I want you to learn, you can't put to death remaining sin in your own power. And most of my Christian life is, is learning that the hard way. You can't put to death remaining sin in your own strength. And the only way, this is such a nasty battle with remaining sin that apart from the Spirit of God, you will not be putting it to death. And we're going to learn how to do that. And we're going to learn that the believer has victory and he's growing in chapter six and in chapter eight. So I'll, I'll try to explain more what I think is going on in chapter seven, but I, I don't think it's all my life is, is this big wreck and big mess with no growth and no victory in any area of my life. I do not believe that is at all what's going on in this passage. So those problems for me far outweigh my ones with the other. And I'll be the first to say, I got problems that I can't answer with the other view. There, there's just some really good arguments in it. And so I, I've got some things I really like about both views and some things that I really don't like about both views. So my goal is to land this plane for a long introduction without violating the rest of scripture and what it teaches about the Christian life for your good. And so we can't fall off the cliff. It's a razor's edge. And we can't fall off on this perfectionism or that this defeat life, your whole life and the Christian life. It, both of those are falling off the razor's edge. So what do I mean? Romans 6 is true. The dominion of sin has been broken. Romans 7 cannot make that untrue. They have to abide together. And Romans 7 can't put you back under the dominion of sin. That can't be what's being said here. So the danger of Paul being unsaved uh, is to downplay the intensity of the battle with remaining sin. And I, I just, just pure victory in everything day in and day out, uh, that will destroy you. The danger of Paul being saved, to downplay the freedom and power that is ours in Christ to live victoriously in the Christian life and to be conformed from one image to the next. I know people who have put their head on the pillow of Romans 7 to, to quit fighting. This is an encouragement to fight and to grow and battle in this Christian life. And so that's the razor's edge that we're going to be walking next week as I unfold this passage. Any questions? Get in your community groups. All right. So the other view, the mature Christian view, <laughs> I lean towards this. This is a popular view of the Reformers and the Puritans. It's still popular among Reformed churches today. And this is the picture of a mature man in the faith. Uh, this is autobiographical of Paul in, in this condition as he writes these words. And so this is a Christian man Loving the law of God, which I call the law of Christ again, this new covenant put in your heart. He's new. He has a new eye. He's been crucified in Christ. Yet he's still surrounded by remaining sin. And he wants to be perfectly holy to his God. And he's coming short. And he's grieved deeply over his sin. And he's looking to Christ alone for deliverance. And I like what Packer said, this is not so much about failure as one growing in his view of God and his holiness 
and hating sin more and more as he sees how deep it really runs in his own heart. The law showed me last week the exceeding sinfulness of sin in verse 13. But my Christian life with my new heart and my desires that still sins has taught me the exceeding, exceeding sinfulness of sin. I've never hated it more in my life. And the glories and beauties of what I've seen in Romans have overwhelmed my heart the last year and a half. And then to give a 10 cent finish breaks me. And it leaves you crying out, who's going to deliver me from the body of this death? Looking at Christ and his word and seeing his glory and grabbing for lesser glory just destroys me. I hate it. And I truly believe if you knew Paul, you would have been amazed at his Christ's likeness and his growing conformity to him. Yet he was more and more aware of the depth of his sin and his life and his heart that made him feel like a wretched man. This was the first thing I learned at seminary when I got there in a little uh, Bible study group. And it was a kind of uh, Paul writing uh, three different stages of his life. And early on as a Christian, he writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, from the least of the apostles, whom not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And then some years later, he pens Ephesians, Ephesians 3, 8. He says, I'm, I'm less than all, I'm the least of all the saints. So I'm the least of the apostles, I'm the least of the saints. And then at the end of his life, when he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And so there's this growing awareness of his wretchedness as he progresses. And I want you to see, this isn't a guy with a bad self-image. This is a guy with a clear view of God. I always like in Acts 9, 7, when he describes his conversion, he says there was a light from heaven. And then as he grows in Acts 22, 6, it says a bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me. And at the end of the book in Acts 26, 13, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun. <laughs> it's just getting brighter and brighter like the noonday sun. And the more he sees God and the more he beholds his glory, the more he's realizing who I am and what it means to live the Christian life and the beauty of it. And there's just this, this oh, wretched man that I am. This is the experience, I believe, of a growing Christian who's died to the law and you're living under grace, and the dominion of sin is broken. You're reckoning yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ, fighting to not let sin reign in your mortal bodies back in Romans 6. You know what that tells me? That it's going to try to. Don't let sin reign again in your mortal bodies was the command in 6.12. Why? Because it, it's going to try. It's going to fight. It's going to get times where it grabs you, and it's going to feel controlling is going to be my explanation next week but you've been married to Christ. You're in a relationship to him so that you might bear fruit for God with remaining sins still in your body, fighting my new desires and my new spirit. I'm in a battle with sin until Romans 8, 23, Paul says we're groaning for the redemption of our bodies. I, I want to be done with sin. I want to be done with this battle. Come Lord Jesus and redeem these bodies. That's the groaning of the believer. I, I hate sin. I hate that I still bow. I love God so much. And I just want to please him and live for him and, and take every thought captive to Christ. I love it. I groan for this battle to be over. Waiting and fighting sin until the wretched man that I am is delivered and I am saved to sin no more. Amen? I can't overemphasize the freedom that has come in Christ. The penalty of sin was removed. We spent a year on the way it can be removed in Jesus Christ. And now we've been studying that the reigning power of sin was also broken and under grace and you're freed from law and you're accepted before God now. I can't overemphasize though the fight that remaining sin still has and is within and seeks to destroy our obedience to the one that we love and the one that we desire 
to obey. I wish I could just tell you, go live perfectly now, man. It's, it's easy. The love boat on the way to heaven, it's a battleship. It's just all out war. But I want you to hear this this morning. It's one, and I think that's the argument of this section, that we will certainly win because we're not under law, but under grace. And God's grace is going to see to it and conform us, and he's going to bring us safely to where we are saved to sin no more. His power will lose none of his own. And one that will certainly uh, end, uh, this war will end when he comes back. And I want you to hear J.I. Packer again. Never mind. I'm going to skip that quote. I'm running out of time. Lastly, this is, my, this is my last point. I know nobody's going to enjoy this on the other view, but it, I, it's mine. Paul never leaves the stone unturned. Have you kind of noticed that? He just, he's a detail guy. He's not like me. He, just, he likes details. And I just think the reality of remaining sin is so big in the Christian life that if that's not what he's dealing with here, it's not being dealt with. Seems simple, doesn't it? What do I mean by that? We have to understand the enemy within as a believer. How does the law function in the heart of a believer? We have seen what it does to an unbeliever. It arouses sin. What does it do to a believer? Well, it fights at the heart level to get you to use your body for sin. That's why he said in Romans 6, don't offer up your members to sin as instruments. So it's trying to get you to use your members to sin against God who you love. It fights to get you to present your members to serve it. And this beast has to be addressed. What happens if it's not? Well, I've already seen it because a few of you have showed up here and you missed a year of how to be justified. And you missed that Christ fulfilled the whole law and he died for every transgression you ever committed and he obeyed it perfectly. So his righteousness is put to your account and God looks at you this morning as if you lived the life Jesus lived. You've missed that. And you've come in in Romans 6 and you're dying and I'm, I'm getting to meet with some of you. It's been beautiful. And if you're dying, come meet with me. You're dying because you're like, I, I can't keep chapter 6. I understood it. But I'm going out here and man, I'm, I'm, I'm finding failure and struggles and battles. I, I'm not even a Christian. That's what I'm hearing on almost every side. It's killing you. And so you came late and you missed Romans 1 through 5, unless you're Cindy and you go back and listen to every one of them in one week probably. <laughs> Hear this, the righteousness that God requires, he gives to you in his son. He imputes it to you. The, the perfection to be in his presence, he gives you as a gift by his son's own obedience. That is the only way you'll ever be acceptable to God. And I have to have that with my fight with remaining sin or I will despair. If I just say thank you and now I'm going to go off and live the Christian life, you will despair. How can I be a Christian? Romans 6 is so beautiful. Fruit for God, new covenant, spirit. I love it. But I'm finding that when I want to please God in every way, there's something at work within me causing me to do things contrary to what I want to do. Romans 7, baby. <laughs> the more intensely I seek holiness to my God, the more I find how deep this principle is within me. The strength of its resistance and the deceptiveness and the consistency of this sin. And I just feel like I'm condemned. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Praise be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord, but I feel condemned. Romans 8, 1, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's for the, the people who are in Romans 7 battling sin. There's, you feel so condemned. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's one who's already been condemned in your place. And the next big question, is this going to separate me from the love of God, my remaining sin? It has to. God hates this stuff. Not even remaining sin can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's the best news a believer could have. You tell me that it's not important to the Christian life and what Paul is talking about. The enemy, so hear this, is not the law. 
The enemy is not the law. Whether outside your heart, what we learned in the last weeks, or whether it's inside, the law is not the problem. And what he wants to keep showing you as an unbeliever, the law wasn't the problem, it was your heart. And now as a believer, the law written in your heart isn't the problem, it's your heart, it's sin. It's sin that remains in the believer. And you have to get this, and I don't believe Paul would leave a stone unturned. And I think he really opens up and he's vulnerable here with his writers. And he pours out his hearts to us of his battle. And I think that's really important to us as I close out as a church to get really open and vulnerable with some intimate brothers and sisters of the battle. Because when, when, there's, when there's no battle with sin, everyone has to come in here and fake it and look squeaky clean when you're falling apart and you're battling and you're struggling and you're yelling at your wife and you, your kids you're being awful to and you're ignoring them. And there's all these things that you're sitting here. I, I just, I'm a good guy. <laughs> Romans 7 can break that. Amen. I don't have to pretend, fake, or pet, be plastic, or have it all together. I'm dying. And we need each other in this fight against remaining sin. And we join together as a church to help each other because this enemy is dangerous. It's deceitful. And we need each other to help us on our way to glory. And this understanding helps with self-righteousness and judging others. When you begin to realize you're remaining rot, when I sit in counseling, I've never one time thought, how can you do that? I hate, you know your own heart. It's going to make you humble with your brothers and sisters. Humility. Kindness says so you take out splinters with your big logs. This understanding keeps us from giving up because what's wrong with me? But what I want you to hear this morning is keep fighting because final relief is coming. O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Until that day, we get the so then of verse 25. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. And so what Paul is giving us here is Christianity 101. As I grow in the knowledge of God and Christ and salvation and what he requires of me, I'm swept away with a desire to glorify him and obey him. And as I learn more and more what he requires of me, MacArthur said, I, your reach will always exceed your grasp. I'll always want to be more holy than I am. Remaining sin keeps me from painting the picture with my life of Jesus Christ that I want to so badly. Spurgeon said, the nearer a man lives to God, the more intensely has he to mourn over his own evil heart. Yet was Paul not a man growing in faith? Yes, he was. I want you to, Romans 7, it said, when the law came, it killed me. It said, don't covet. And all I found was coveting. And then he writes in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. <laughs> I don't covet anything. I'm satisfied in Christ. That's growing. That's what should be happening in our lives. And so this isn't, this isn't saying you won't be growing and having victory and all that we're going to learn. That is not what's happening. And so I pray that what we are seeing in Romans is stirring your heart and you're frustrated because you want to serve him more you want to pray with more devotion. You want deeper communion. You, you hate the lust that rages in your heart. You hate the tongue that keeps slandering your pride, your selfishness, your irritability with the kids. And Spurgeon says, it's my agonizing death struggle with my corruption that proves me to be a living child of God. Newton said, I can only remember two things on my deathbed. I'm a great sinner and he's a great savior. Bunyan's conclusion is that my only hope is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and that I am a sinner and it will always be my hope. So I, 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 I'm going to show you next week how Romans 7 is, it's going to have to always be leading us to a righteousness, not our own. You're, you're, you're never going to be able to look at your own and say, oh, <laughs> I'm acceptable to God. You will always look at it and groan and rejoice that there's a gospel of an alien righteousness that can be put to your account. John MacArthur said, one day you were all sinner, one day you'll be all saint in heaven, but until then you're a sinner saint in this battle. And so this is the opposite of what much of Christianity is chasing after today. 
the deeper life, the jovial life, and complete freedom from sin by our seminars and these teachings. I'm going to close the same way I did 20 years ago. Back to J.I. Packer and we'll be done. And this is what really helped me because I was in the same battle. He says, I remember as a young Christian, I joined a religious group on campus and they taught there were two sorts of Christians. A first class Christian who's really spiritual and a second class Christian that is carnal. And the first class, they knew sustained peace and joy. They had regular victory over temptation and sin. uh, And they were able to be used of God only in that state. And as a new convert, my temperament had not been changed overnight, Packer says. So that ex- spiritual experience was just not mine. And he said that there was a, there, there was told there's a way to rise then from carnality to spirituality. All you have to do is let go and let God. You just need to be spirit filled. Deny self, your selfish patterns from birth and Christ living through me, my will, his will, let go and he'll direct me consecration and faith, laying over all on the altar, emptying myself and being filled with the Holy Spirit was what I was taught. Hand over all my temptations for Christ to battle and he'll banish it. And in that methodology, you will have complete freedom from sin. H.A. Ironside, the pastor of Moody Memorial Church in Chicago said, I drove myself to a full scale mental breakdown trying to do it that way. Packer said, I almost killed myself. This is deathly seriously. Why? He said, there's got to be something I haven't consecrated to God. I must still be on the throne. And I just assumed all my peers had no problem with sin because you got to fake it when that's the, the, the standard. It's a totally false view of battling sin. And it led to my absolute discouragement. Do we understand indwelling sin is normal? And Pogo said, we've met the enemy and it's us. Do we understand the battle with sin is lifelong? And Packer said, I can say dogmatically that a proper understanding of Romans 7 has saved my sanity and brought a genuine joy I have never known before in my Christian life. And so as I close out, I, we'll look next week and we'll unfold the verses but I, 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 when we were in Romans 1 through 3, I, I was coming after you because Paul's showing you your guilt, your, whether you're moral or immoral, religious or irreligious, you're guilty under God. And it says that his wrath is upon you in that whole section. And he wants to show you that you're rightfully under it and you can't explain it away or ignore it. It's under you. And I was preaching that to show you that you need Jesus Christ as a savior. And then he looked at the law and he showed you the law was never given for you to be a good enough person to climb up it and go to church and change yourself up. That was never a way to get right with God. And then we came to to the cross and I prayed that as we looked at all that Jesus did for us and the righteousness that he gives to us, that it would cause you to look at that beauty and to repent and flee to Jesus Christ and be saved. And then in Romans chapter 6, we saw that the dominion of sin is broken. And I was praying that if you were unsaved, it would tutor you to Christ. That you would, you would realize, man, the dominion of sin is still in my life. And then in Romans 7, to, if you're still under the law and you're trying to keep it and you're just coming short and you're living in guilt, I want to show you there's a better way to die to the law and come and stand under grace and receive Christ. And now this morning, my last attempt is that maybe you're sitting under Romans 7 and you got a false view of it your whole life. Is I, I don't really love the things of God. I don't desire them. I, I just, I do it because I was raised this way. I grew up in a good homeschool family. I was taught. I know how to do this. And, and so I, I just, I, I, my whole life is Romans 7, but that isn't Romans 7. That's Romans 1 through 3. Your, your heart hasn't been changed. You haven't realized that I love sin and that's what I do and that's all I ever do and that's my desire and I don't repent. It's just who I am. But Romans 7 is my little Houdini. It's my escape act out from under who I really am. And so I just pray this morning that maybe God would take that away and there's something better than hiding falsely in Romans 7. There's a cross where the Prince of Glory hung and died in your place for all of these sins. And the one who will repent and come to him by faith will be saved and washed and cleansed and the penalty of sin will be taken away 
and that power will finally be broken and you will find freedom and freedom to begin to walk and grow. And one day, you're going to lose remaining sin forever and will be saved to sin no more in glory. And so I want to offer you Jesus Christ this morning if you've hit under Romans 7 falsely. And so come to Jesus if there hasn't been that new nature and new heart made within you. Let's pray. Father, this is a technical, long, hard sermon. Thank you for your sons and daughters who locked in and wrestled because it matters. It matters uh, what, what's being said here. And so, Father, I pray that um, as we journey it, you will set your children free. God, for some who have just been living under the burden of, of the enemy whispering when it's a true Romans 7, there's just this new nature that longs to do what's right and flesh that's opposing and fighting, and they're sitting here under condemnation. They put themselves back under law. I'm condemned because I'm not perfectly keeping the law. God, set them free this morning that there's one who did. Bring them back under grace and to put their faith and their hope in Christ, and that that will empower them to overcome these epithumias, these over-desires, these lusts in their own heart, and they can begin to to be transformed to the image of Christ and to grow. And so, Father, I pray that you will do that work in hearts. And I pray that you will encourage your children who, who today realize again, man, my, my remaining sin, is, it, is, it is fighting me. And, and I just pray, let them look again to Christ and receive the fullness of forgiveness and righteousness. Our righteousness will never be enough to stand before you. I pray let us all look again to the only righteousness that will ever allow us to be acceptable in your presence. Praise be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, I pray. Amen.